Welcome to the Broken Vessels Podcast. Jeremiah 18.4 states, And the vessel he was making of clay was spoiled in the potter's hand, and he reworked it into another vessel, as it seemed good to the potter to do. This is the Broken Vessels Podcast. I'm your host, Joshua Simpkins. This is a podcast where we have discussions on theological themes for the broken to bring encouragement to and hope in Christ. And I would like to welcome you back to the Broken Vessels podcast. And I'm so thankful that you've joined me. I have a really special episode for you all today. Um, I have a couple that I have met online, a couple that I've heard some of their story, and God has just really used that in a way to just really brings a lot of hope and encouragement in Christ. And that's what we're all about here at the Broken Vessels podcast is hope and encouragement in Christ, theological themes to bring hope and encouragement in Christ. I have uh, Brad and Jennifer Moody of uh, Wisconsin. They're just, they don't have any theological credentials or any PhDs or anything like that, but they're just a couple just living life, raising their kids, doing life. But they have been through the ringer, no doubt about it. And they're going to share that with us today. They're going to share with us about what it means to be broken, but also to know what it means to be in effect healed and continuing to heal by the gospel of Jesus Christ and by understanding proper theology. Brothers and sisters in Christ, marriage is hard. Life is hard. And this couple, out of so many in the faith, can tell you that truth. But this couple has been through it. And they know what it means to be broken. They know what it means to fight and struggle in the fight of the faith and to know what it means to struggle as a couple. And by God's grace, God has worked in their hearts and in their lives and has done something in their marriage that has brought them grace to be able to stay together and to understand the gospel together and to grow in that grace and knowledge together. And when I heard Jennifer share her story on another podcast. It just, I thought to myself, man, these are the people that I want talking to my listeners because they really know what it means, number one, to be broken, but they also know what it means to be healed and to be continuing to be healed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so I'd like to welcome Brad and Jennifer Moody of Rothschild, Wisconsin. And uh, guys, welcome to the Broken Vessels podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having Thank us. You. All right. Well, I'm going to start off today. Um, you know, we talk about brokenness in marriage and just brokenness in general. It's a really difficult thing. And I know like from the background I come from, and I know from talking with you guys on a personal level from the background you come from, marriage is almost like the end all be all. So like if your marriage doesn't work out, like that's the end of life. (laughs) So it can really have a detrimental impact on the way that you just even individually interact with the world and even with yourself. But Uh, with yourselves as a couple. So I want to start off. I just want you guys to go ahead and share. And Jennifer, if you want to share, start off sharing um, kind of where you came from as a young woman growing up in um, the background you grew up in. And then Brad, you can come in and share on that as well, uh, kind of where you came from. I want to hear your all's backgrounds before you met um, the kind of religious or whatever you want to call it, church construct Mm -hmm. that you lived within so that we can get kind of a flavor of like where you guys were coming from. So go ahead and share that. Jen, you go ahead and start. All right. So I grew up independent, fundamental Baptist, very heavy 
Gothard Influence uh, Vision Forum. So growing up in that as a girl, it kind of, there was, as I later came to understand a very um, prosperity gospel leaning to that of, you know, the purity culture, if you do this or don't do this in your life, you will have a happy marriage. So, you know, keep yourself pure um, and purity equaled, you know, virginity. And then once you're married, like you have all of these expectations on you being a good wife and mom to keep your husband and keep your marriage intact. And it was pretty much all placed on me to keep the marriage intact. Mm-hmm. Went to many like seminars as a kid, um, starting at the age of 13 until I graduated that were aimed at women and so many purity talks. And on top of that, there was just this really harsh view of God where he, I had this mental image of him just like up there with a baseball bat ready to smack me over the head anytime I did anything wrong. (laughs) Um, So I was constantly living in fear. My salvation was often questioned when I would disobey my parents. And so I can honestly say there were probably several years in my teen years where I, every night I would pray and ask God, if I'm not saved, please save me because I was terrified of going to hell. Made many professions of faith publicly. I think I was baptized at least twice. I made a profession at the age of five while going through Awana. And then again, at around the age 10, uh, when my parents got saved, um, they had both also grown up in Christian homes, but they came to realize that their faith was not their own, but they were, quote unquote, really writing their parents' um, spiritual coattails. And they came to that understanding for themselves. And I saw that in them. And I said, I want that. And so I made a profession as well. Growing up in my teen years, uh, under that Gothard influence, as I said, there was very high expectations. For those who don't know Gothard, I'm sure you would know the name Duggar. Um, We grew up very similar to that. You know, no pants, no dating, I, my interaction with the opposite sex was very limited. And so um, when I went to college, I was, I was not allowed to date. Anyone who wanted to even get to know me needed to call and ask my dad's permission. So there wasn't really an, like getting to know someone, even as a friend, before you decided to date. It was like, if you wanted to get to know someone, you were automatically dating. Right. And... And you don't date to get to know someone, you date to marry. Hmm. So there was just a lot of pressure constantly um, with wanting to get to know anyone. So I didn't have any idea how to interact with, you know, boys. And when I was 17, I had kissed a boy. And the reaction to that was to lock me in my room and put doors on the or I'm sorry, bells on the door. Um, And I was told to cut off all my hair because I was too pretty. And for two years, then I was just continually punished in that I was not allowed out of my parents' sight at church. I, any interaction with any, you know, boy, I, I got punished, um, And I was spanked until the age of 19, um, which was when I talked to a boy. So, again, just very harsh understanding of God, because in that environment, my dad was meant to be a picture of God. So, yeah, that's kind of my environment. And I was about to go into how Brad and I met, but I'll I'll wait for that. Okay, Brad, (laughs) um, can you go ahead and share your experience yeah. growing up. Well, I will, I'll echo a lot of um, what she said. A little different environment. I, for instance, never heard of the name Bill Gothard um, growing up. However, uh, since going through a lot of these things, I 
have realized and seen his influence definitely affected the environment I grew up in. And I was a preacher's kid. I grew up in uh, the home of a pastor at an independent fundamental Baptist church that he started. And he started the church plant and kind of built it up from nothing. And emphasis on the independence, you know, he kind of, there. there's a great pride in um, not really associating or answering to anyone for anything. I think that very negatively affects leadership accountability as well as the theology in that environment. Yeah, uh, There's such an emphasis on um, pastoral leadership that it's kind of like a pastor needs his Bible, you know, the, the Bible. My Bible and the Holy Spirit, and that's that's all I need. Right. Um, and just a lot of legalism, more than specific interactions that stand out to me now as I look back, is just the root of so many things I see as theological. There, there's such an emphasis on me. Um, it's definitely a more Arminian environment in terms of soteriology and salvation. Your decision how the decisions you make reflect how God blesses you or doesn't bless you. I find that interesting because, uh, as many of you know, I grew up in that same kind of background, a, a fundamentalist background. And I do find that it almost has a vibe of the Word of Faith movement to a degree. Would you agree with that, Brad? Yeah, I think so. I'm less familiar with that, but from what little I know, I could see some similarities. Mm -hmm. Well, the whole idea of if you do A, B, or C, then you're going to be blessed. But if you do A, B, or or if you do D, E, and F, then Mm -hmm. you're going to be condemned and uh, you're not going to get the quote-unquote physical blessings in this world. And Mm -hmm. somehow that's a uh, measure of your spirituality really truthfully. So, yeah, yeah, definitely. I would agree with that. And the, my dad would often preach and teach on principles and, um, I still see a value to Christian principles. Mm -hmm. Um, but they flowed out of a very legalistic mindset, a a very man centered decisional, understanding of christianity like you said your decisions will affect it, it's vastly a blending of the law and the gospel not getting theology proper accurate uh-huh. um you're left to see the demands of the law as meritorious right. and i think they would outwardly or they would deny that if you said it just like that Right. There is a form of teaching of grace, a form of understanding that God makes this possible, but then in reality, it's up to you. What's right. your deci- you know, what's your decision going to And I think experientially we all experience blessings and the effects of poor choices. That is that's just a natural part of life. Mm-hmm. But when it comes to our walk with God, our choices do not produce his grace his grace is is a free gift it is it's what produces the right choices in us later as we grow in him you know it's that things get out of order and when we get those things out of order it turns man back on himself Mm -hmm. in fear and oftentimes from leadership um, manipulation out of goodwill good intentions but the gospel lacks the, the, the true grace of the gospel, the work of Christ, his righteousness, his holiness, it's just, it's not there. Okay, so you guys have shared with our listeners and with me your background separately, but now I'd like you to share how y'all mm-hmm. met, how you came to know each other, how you became connected. So Brad, if you want to go ahead and start with kind of your perspective, and then we'll let Jen come in and share her perspective. Sure. Well, I... Um, Ended up at a Bible college, and I knew of Jennifer. She was friends with a friend of mine, but I had not met her. She grew up in a church about two hours away that we somewhat associated with, and my dad's church did. My dad actually was friends with Jennifer's grandparents years back before we were even born. 
through different religious associations. And so there's a lot of common ground in theology and that sort of background in church. And you know, in college, I was at the time dating somebody else, but developed a friendship with Jennifer through the ensemble. We both sang in the uh, school's ensemble that rep- represented the school and did some traveling together, kind of had uh, developed a friendship from that perspective, but not necessarily in, uh, in, in an interest in each other at that time. That led to, I ended up leaving school, going back home, pursuing some work for a while. I'm mm-hmm. um, not sure kind of what I was going to do with my life, what I wanted to do. Um, I initially was asked to go to Bible college for a year, kind of forced. Right. And I went to a different school, very fundamental Baptist, I would even argue cultish. Mm-hmm. Um, and a lot of I, my my attitude was that I went there to please my dad because that's what he wanted. I really had no desire to be there. So, so much pietism in the school, so much legalism, an incredible amount of crushing man centeredness. Right. Ended up getting in some trouble. I came forward kind of turned myself in because of it. I was the only one that didn't get kicked out of the school at the time. And yeah, that I ended up my year there, went home and, you know, actually going back home after that year of school felt, <laughs> it's going to sound awful. It felt like going back to prison mm. in some ways, just the mentality at home, the environment was unhealthy and unhelpful for a young person trying to grow up and think things through and, Right. Having been away and then coming back to that was really crushing, and I felt like I needed out. And the only real acceptable way of doing that was, hey, I should go back to Bible college. Maybe this time I'll go somewhere I want to go and try to apply myself a little more. Yeah. So the school, the school that I ended up going back to was where I met Jennifer, and it was still very much an acceptable school in my parents' eyes, still fit that criteria. But I felt more desire and freedom simply because I uh, I think because I chose it and because it was a little further away and um, kind of outside of the circle that I knew and grew up in. I had siblings that were on staff at the first school I went to. That was where we met and um, spent a lot of time together. After that, I went home and ended up losing track of a lot of people from that school. Mm-hmm. The school had some issues and kind of dissolved and split up. I wondered what happened to Jennifer. She just came to mind. And so I started asking and through Facebook was in contact with a few people wondering where she was and got her, got her information and called her up one day Hmm. out of the blue. (laughs) Okay, Jen, go, go ahead and share kind of your experience on your end about like how you met Brad and how you guys interacted. Yeah. So, um, I don't even know if my parents know this, but I guess they will now. I knew of Brad, as he had said through his best friend. He, his friend had gone to my church and um, was interested in me and so gave me his number. And me being just, yeah, uh, in the environment I was in, he kind of became someone I would call just to have a friend. And I would talk to him and... I didn't know this, but apparently there were many times where I would call and just talk and not let this guy talk back. (laughs) And so often he would hand the phone to Brad while he did other things because they carpooled to the same job. And I talked to Brad um, thinking that it was that it was someone else. Mm. So I (laughs) and I knew of Brad because because his friend talked about him. And I remember seeing him at a couple different college age activities at at the church that I grew up in when he came with with his friend to segue into like actually meeting him. I at the age of I think I was either 17 or 18 or it was right at that cusp of like. 17 turning 18. Anyway, I got caught with Michael W. Smith Newsboys, Rebecca St. James CDs. Oh my goodness. And (laughs) (laughs) I know. And, um, I was kicked out of the house. Um, I am what a rebel, right? right? (laughs) So, um, I am the oldest of four and, uh, At the time, my parents were very deep into S.M. Davis, and um, 
his advice was that, you know, I needed to be kicked out so that my influence didn't influence the younger siblings. Okay. Let me just stop you here. You got kicked out of the house because you had CCM quote unquote CDs kicked out of the house. Seriously. Okay. Seriously. All right. So to be, um, fair, at first, to be fair, in that environment, like that's that wasn't uncommon. No, yeah, I, mean, I agree with right. you, but I'm just that's like normal. Kind of, I'm still kind that of was, blown away by that. It was very yeah. bad. Very bad. Okay. <laughs> Continue. <laughs> okay. So um I while I was in the hotel room that I was dropped off at, I called Brad's friend, just like, you know, crushed and in tears. And he was the only person I knew a phone number to and the only person I could think of to contact. I was just distraught. And from what I later found out, we had been in contact like secretly because I wasn't allowed to talk to boys. And he had been talking to Brad's older brother um, about me and Brent's um, advice was like, you know, it was wrong for us to be talking because my parents didn't know and, Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I should be honoring them and and I respect that. And so um, this guy was like, you need to go back home and, you know, honor your parents. But if you, if you want to get out I know of this college in Indiana that um, my friend is at that you should go to. And so that's how I found out about that college. And um, I ended up living with my grandparents for quite a while. But being homeschooled, I I had to go back home in order to finish my schooling and and graduate. So I had just turned 19 before I finally graduated. And I mentioned this school to my parents and they had heard about it. It was an older school, so they knew of it and, and they agreed to let me go there. So I got there and I, I meet Brad and, you know, again, I had known of him. And so it was like, yay, I finally get to meet you. And I thought, wow, he's actually a lot cuter than I <laughs> like I remember because um at the time I had not been interested in him but he had a girlfriend and so it was like oh well okay so yes we became friends we had um common issues his, I was interested in someone else at the school that my parents were very adamant they did not want me being interested in uh-huh. um they really didn't want me being interested in anyone in fact they drove down to the college and talked to the dean of students and told him i was not allowed to date and to keep me from dating uh-huh. brad and i were just friends and we kind of bonded over this mutual his parents didn't like his girlfriend my parents didn't like the guy i was interested in and so, and then as Brad had said, we traveled in ensemble together. Um, I was actually friends with his girlfriend. And so Brad was just a friend. But as we went our separate ways after the college kind of had issues, I lost touch because, again, I wasn't allowed to talk to to boys. So um, I ended up at Maranatha Baptist Bible College in Watertown, Wisconsin. And while I was there, again, my my parents actually got the cell phone bill with numbers listed and would call numbers they didn't recognize to keep me from talking to boys. So I found out that they could call my dorm room and I got that bill. Mm. <laughs> so I would give that number out. And one of the girls from the college had given my number to Brad. And I, at the time, I had just figured that he had married this girl that he was with. I knew that they were serious and so hadn't really thought of him. But um, he called me and he was just like, I've been thinking of you. And I remember running down the hall in my girl's dorm going, Brad, he just called me. And all the girls are like, we don't know who that is, but good for you. (laughs) (laughs) And so we kind of, we hit it off really fast. Um, He asked my dad for permission to date me and my dad said no. Mm. So we, we, um, this was in the time of instant messenger. Mm -hmm. And we kept in contact that way until... Let's see, it had to have been second semester, spring break. I was nearing the end of my you know, year 
of being in college, which again, I was supposed to go for one year. And I I just, I really didn't want to go back home. Uh, I had more freedom at my strict Bible college than I did at home. And mm. I had a job lined up. I had a place to live with, with me or not the faculty. I, I just didn't want to go home. And so over spring break, I told my parents, like, you know, I, I have a place to live. I plan to live, you know, in Watertown over the summer. And that Gothard influence, I was leaving the umbrella of protection. Mm-hmm. And that was not acceptable. And they took me to counseling with their pastor and um, said if I left, I would be ruining my life and I would no longer be allowed back ever. Mm-hmm. And I went into it with a good attitude, like, I'm going to ask permission, see what they say. And then I left, like, fine, if that's how you feel, I'm gone. And I left. And on my way out, my dad said, date who you want, marry who you want, just send me an invitation to the wedding so I know who it is. And, and I want to put this disclaimer in here now that my family and I are on good terms. My parents have changed a lot. Again, you know, I'm the oldest. So there was a lot of learning with me. They've come through a lot and have grown a lot and aren't the same people. So I just want to put that out there. We, we have a really good relationship now and they love Brad to death. (laughs) Yeah, But yeah. So anyway, I called Brad and just like, you know, heartbroken and we started dating a week later. (laughs) Um, and we got engaged, let's see, Octo- in October. So we started dating March 31st of 2007 and got engaged October 2nd of 2007 and married December 13th of 2007. Mm-hmm. But growing up in the purity culture, you know, having sex before marriage meant you were ruined. Like the girl, right. it was chewed up piece of bubble gum, a glass of water with spit in it, you know, mm-hmm. many, many metaphors. We, we did, we had had sex before we were married mm-hmm. and, and I, I don't recommend that. And I know it's wrong, right. but we did. And so my parents at the time, um, I had called them to try to patch things up because after I left, um, you know, I wasn't allowed to talk to my siblings. I had a really, terrible relationship with my parents and I wanted to apologize for the attitude in which I had left and at the time my mom was certain that I was coming to tell them that I was pregnant Mm -hmm. and when I didn't she just flat out asked me are you a virgin and I broke down in tears and I'm like no and so my dad's like you call Brad and tell him to come here (laughs) and Brad did and then my dad looked at him and said so when is the wedding And Brad's like, well, you know, we had already been planning on getting married. We had been talking about it. And my dad's like, no, you're giving me a date. And Brad's like, well, sometime next year. Nope. Mm. (laughs) It will be now. And so, yeah, we were engaged, I think, a week later. Um, My parents drove me to his parents' house. And we had sat across the table from each other. And Brad slid the ring across the table and asked me to marry him. And I said, yes. And then we just stared at each other because, like, didn't know what to do. We weren't allowed to hug or, like, have any physical contact. And then my parents and his parents drove us to the mall where I dropped off my ring to have it resized. And it was the most awkward engagement ever. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. (laughs) Um, And our wedding was, um, we weren't allowed to have a wedding. I didn't deserve it. So seriously, um, you you guys did not have like a traditional wedding with family or anything. Well, with family. Um, so it was kind of like a courthouse wedding. I was allowed a dress, but I wasn't allowed. I had to add a color into it. Um, I, because I, I couldn't wear a white dress. Um, and only our immediate families were invited. So, and at the time, Brad was a very, controlling person Mm -hmm. um and he went and picked out my dress with his mom and -hmm. said this is this is your dress everything about the wedding was how you know he wanted it um there were times in the planning of it that I was just I said I don't want to do this I don't want to marry you and he just laughed and I at the time felt like actually this is my only option because I'm not a virgin anymore. No one else will want me. 
And so at, I loved Brad and the way that, you know, I knew how at the time, but um, I also felt like I had no other option. Right. And there were many things that showed up in that I didn't, I knew irritated me, but I didn't recognize it as like controlling or abusive. Yeah. Um, partly just because of the environment I had grown up in. It was just a continuation of that. Obviously, for our listeners, we've done some episodes on pietism. We've done some episodes on fundamentalism and coming out of fundamentalism. Uh, I, You all know personally that I myself came out of the fundamentalist uh, environment. This right here, hearing the story of this couple and just their own separate takes on what they came from, what that did for them and the the way that it formed them and the way that they interacted with each other as a result. Already, we are starting to see there is a brokenness there. There is something that causes brokenness in the way that, especially young people, you know, and that, that's something we need to really, really get and understand is how detrimental fundamentalism and pietism and all of these things have on young people, because it, it's very hard for them to parse through truth and to be able to really grow and understand what's going on. And they're just doing what they're told or they're trying to follow what's right. Many young people are trying to just do the right thing. Uh, Jen just said, I want to honor my parents, right? But I think many of you would say from hearing what we're hearing, there was a very oppressive, abusive environment going on just in general across the board as far as just the community that they were growing up in. I've experienced it. Many friends that I have have experienced it, and it can have a very detrimental effect. Now, um, we've learned about how Jen and Brad got to know each other, how they eventually came together. Not ideal. I I would say not ideal, (laughs) but um, definitely a, a story of brokenness, right? A story that tells us that, hey, this is a a broken situation. It comes from a broken ideology and it caused brokenness. And um, I already know these guys' stories (laughs) and it's rough and they're getting ready to share with you how much further and darker it goes. Buckle up and just get ready to hear how this kind of ideology and this kind of thinking can affect relationships and behavior. All right. But there's hope coming to the end of the story. Just keep that in mind too. So uh, Brad, I want you to share uh, from your perspective. Okay. You guys have gotten married. Situation has come together. Jen's going to share her perspective here in a moment, but from your perspective, as the man and kind of where you were at spiritually and theologically, how did that affect your relationship with your wife? How did that affect just your personal spiritual life as you were just trying to walk, quote unquote, the straight and narrow? Go ahead and share that. Well, I think a number of things come to mind to understand a graceless view of God And to constantly be fed God as this judge that is constantly looking over your shoulder, waiting to clobber you upside the head because you didn't uphold enough morals or toe the line, that translated into a lot of patriarchy. Um, And I didn't understand this then at the time. And I think deep down, I had a desire to do right. I, I wanted to please God. But I also felt like no matter how hard I tried, it was never enough. And it was like a roller coaster. You'd go through times where you felt good about yourself and then things would fall apart. And it was like, you're never good enough. And 
then you throw up your hands and be like, well, whatever, you know, <laughs> if, if, yeah. if I'm going to fail at this, then I'm going to just, well, enjoy it because right. this, this sucks. This is miserable. Yeah. And, um, and then you willingly dive into sin knowing that it's wrong, but frustrated. This was my experience anyways. And then the Holy spirit would bring guilt and I do. And then I would feel ashamed and hurt and try to, you know, repent. And I know, I know this isn't right. I know this isn't what I want for my life, you know, and then you go back to church and then you embrace moralism again. And Mm -hmm. then you're like, I'm going to try to be better. I can do more. I know that if I just apply myself more, I can please God. I can, I can do these things that the law commands. Right. And, and, um, you know, you, as long as you minimize the moral law enough, you'll find an aspect of keeping it that may, that, you know, that seems like you're doing well, but that's really the only way that you can. And, but you, yeah, you left, you left back to introspection and, and looking within for righteousness and I think that that overall view bled into my understanding of marriage and even what I've seen in emotional abuse and spiritual abuse. I never understood those terms then. Now I see it all over. Mm-hmm. And the more we've studied and understood emotional abuse is a thing. I was incredibly, incredibly abusive husband. I've seen so much spiritual abuse from the pulpit, degrading people, manipulating people in the name of morality and serving God. And it's horrible. It produces a terrible implication of who God is. And it denies his love and grace. That is that is the story of the gospel. Not that we could keep him happy, mm-hmm. but that we can't, that we never will be able to until we're glorified in heaven. Um, and that's why we look to him as our savior, not only at the beginning of our salvation, but throughout our life, we look to him for our righteousness. I I really, I I really resonate (laughs) with what you're talking about here because I experienced that. And many already are going to have heard my story that I've shared already on the podcast and coming from the backgrounds that we come from, it's very much that way. We we didn't understand. We didn't get it. In some senses of the word, we were programmed to think in a certain way, and it has detrimental effects on the way that we behave, and it has detrimental effects on the way that we interact, specifically with the people closest to us. Mm-hmm. Well, that leads me to our, the beginning of our marriage then. My role model for marriage was that... I would understand now as patriarchy. I was the man. Thus, I was the authority. I was the spiritual leader. I made the money. And my wife exists for me. Uh, She cleans the house. She will bear the kids, take care of her kids, school the kids, Mm -hmm. and be there for me whenever I want, whenever I need. And it just continued to nurture the already selfishness of my heart and led to more and more selfish desires. There was no care for her, no love in the, in the sense that Christ loves us, which I would argue I still didn't completely understand. Mm -hmm. And I was, I was extremely hurtful, manipulative and abusive. I, I thought, and I thought that it was acceptable. I thought that if you would have said that I was abusive, then I, I would have laughed. You're, you're crazy. I'm just doing what God called me to do. Mm-hmm. And that's to be the man of the house and keep my woman and my house in line. Let's go ahead and hear what Jen's perspective yeah. was from the beginning of the marriage to um, kind of where it kind of devolved into. Sure. Okay. So um, in my understanding of marriage, again, I existed for, for him. And having come from my environment, it was my job to keep my husband from sinning. And so it was like my one job was to keep my husband sexually satisfied so that he didn't need to find it elsewhere. And then to also protect him. That's a lot of of responsibility and weight. (laughs) 
<laughs> yes, yes, and it was crushing. I'll, I'll say that I remember in um, we had two sections of marriage counseling, once with my dad and once with um, Jennifer's would-be pastor at the time. And, and I specifically remember my dad telling my future wife that it wasn't right for her ever to have a headache and that if she didn't take care of me, I'd find it elsewhere. Oh my goodness. And that, that was, that's whether spoken or unspoken strongly, the emphasis that's implied all the time. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So in that he treated me terribly. He and I now as I understand what abuse is, he abused me in every way possible. And I would tell people and the the reactions I got were kind of like, well, I'm really sorry, but I actually had a couple people tell me, but this is your bed you made now sleep in it. Um, like because we had had sex before we were married, then I really didn't deserve to expect better from my marriage because this was not God's will for me. It was God's permissive will. It was God's second best. Mm -hmm. And so, so I just kind of, I don't mean to interrupt you there, but just for our listeners, folks, God doesn't have a plan A and a plan B. All right. In the Mm -hmm. sovereignty of God, God's plan is always plan A. All right in his sovereignty and he takes us through what he takes us through for a purpose and a reason. Uh, you may be thinking to yourself, man, I really resonate with what Jen is talking about here. Like, Oh, maybe I'm in the situation I w- I'm in because of my bad decision-making. Is there an aspect to which that can have an impact? Yeah. But you know what? God already had a plan for that. And that was his plan all along. Um, I, I grew up with that ideology as well. The whole plan A, plan B, or God's perfect will, God's permissive will. All right. And we may do an episode on that eventually, but I'm sorry. That's flawed understanding of who God is and theology. That's a denial of the sovereignty of God. It, it definitely is. Absolute denial. It, 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 it's a complete denial of God actually being in control. And somehow the control is back in your court. And somehow everything you do, somehow God's like up there, like fumbling around trying to figure out, oh my goodness, well, now she's got to, she's got to figure it out because she screwed up and she's got to, you know, bite the bullet and do what she's got to do because she's horrible. No, (laughs) that's not the way it works. I just want to, I want input here. I don't think it's right to, to belittle the effect of sin because when we sin, there are consequences. There, yeah, there is certainly. real life hurt and pain that we feel that we go through that in no way happens outside of God's plan for us. That's right. Nor does, I mean, God, you, you look through the Old Testament and New Testament, and you find all sorts of ways. Do you read Job? God allowed things to happen for his, for good. Yeah, and Job had no idea. He didn't know what yep. was going on behind the scenes. And there's an understanding that there are secondary means that God uses in our lives right. to mold us and shape us into his image and to bring us to a place where eventually you guys came. And mm-hmm. I, I just want to make that clear because I know a lot of people are listening to what Jen is just talking about and they're like thinking to themselves, oh man, like that's where I am. And man, I'm where I'm at because I'm horrible. (laughs) Brothers and sisters in Christ, no. (laughs) You got to look to Jesus. You got to look to Christ. You got to understand that no matter what you've done in your life, Christ has a purpose in it. The word of God tells us over and over again, he sets our steps. Man, in the Psalms, it talks about how he sets our steps, but not only that, but he literally has written down what our life is going to be like and what it's going to do and how we're going to behave and all of that. God's in control. He knows what's going on. All right. And we can trust him with what, even with our bad decisions, that doesn't mean God is behind our bad decisions, but he already knows what's going on. All right. And we can trust him and have faith in him that whatever we've done, 
he's going to take that and he's going to use that in a way to mold us and shape us into his image. So I just want to make that clear. I do apologize for interrupting you, Jen. Go ahead and continue. Oh, oh no worries. So in all of that, I came to believe that I deserve um, how I was being treated, that this was God's punishment for not doing things the right way. And there came a point when Brad had actually hit me and I called a cousin and told him what had happened. And one of my uncles and his entire family came to my house and said, we are not leaving without you. And um, at the time I was just terrified because I was under this impression, like two things. One, I was afraid if I left, I would never come back. And I was also raised with the permanent view of marriage. And so I was afraid of the shame that I would bring my family if I left. Yeah. And so I was scared and I, I said, you know, I, I can't leave with you. And I, I stayed, at, but I appreciate that they affirmed that that was not okay. Right. Because then my family got all upset and said that that was, wrong of my uncle to do that. He should never have gotten involved that I had smart mouth to my husband and deserved it. So, um, I just went through many years of just like reading marriage books and trying to figure out how to live with the marriage that I had. And, um, I ended up reading Debbie Pearl's book created to be his helpmate. And if anyone knows what that book is like, it is, it is one of the worst marriage books. And if you have it, burn it because (laughs) it is terrible. And it basically just told me two things. One, that my husband was just a command man and he was a representative of God, the father, Mm -hmm. um, because men in the book, she talks about, um, the three different kinds of men that are kind of representative of the Trinity. And my husband was, authoritative and was representative of God, the father. And so it was not a flaw in him. It was just the way that God created him. And I needed to learn how to be the kind of wife that supported him and didn't take him off. And then two, it was my, again, it was my job to keep him sexually fulfilled. And it was hard. We struggled a lot in that. Yeah. And Brad wants to I was just going to input that that really reinforced a victim mentality that I felt in in terms of pornography and self desire. Just if like if my wife wasn't there for me, then this wasn't my fault. This is right. normal. I I can't help this. She's not she's not doing her part. There is no sense of accountability for my actions, and it absolutely is sin. Right. You know the way the way I was treating her the way we were living, my, the whole construct. Um, I, I want, I just want the, this the little disclaimer because I feel like it's easy looking back now to see, Oh, like now this makes sense. Why I did this. This makes sense. Why I did that. Like all the pieces are coming together, mm-hmm. but really none of that negates the accountability that I carry for the sin within me. Right. And, and that, that's, that's on me. I mean, yeah, I may have been raised in this environment. Yes. I may have been told this, there may be flaws all over in it, but I still believed it. And I still am accountable for the actions that I, that I made. Right. Right. So, um, so you guys have given us a good flavor of what just going right into marriage I mean, this is a hot mess, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it got worse. Yeah. It's dysfunction all over the place. (laughs) So, and I know it got worse. I've, I've, I've heard the story and Jen, go ahead and continue and kind of talk about like kind of what this turned into. And then we'll hear Brad's perspective from that. Sure. So with that, you know, understanding that all of my husband's sexual sin was on me. He just was so unkind in how he treated me, in how he talked about my appearances and just all these different things. And I just got to a point where I 
I actually told him, I wish it wasn't a sin for him to see a prostitute because I wanted to be his wife, but I didn't want to be intimate with him. And so that kind of led us to a place where he was like, oh, well, why don't we see other people? And it isn't bad if we know about it, right? So you can go see someone else. And I, like, he had kind of this picture of what he wanted in a girl, and I, I didn't fit that. So he thought that this would be his chance to, um, like, I was wife material. I, he knew I was the person he wanted to spend the rest of his life with. But as far as like in bed, I wasn't what he envisioned, what he wanted. And I, I genuinely could not be enough for him. So we came to this agreement to have an open marriage. Um, and now, at the time, now you guys have, have you had any of your kids by this time? Yes. My oldest was a year and a half. Okay. And I look back now and I praise God so much for the protection that he gave our family during that time. Right. Because, so yeah, we had an open marriage and began seeing other people. And at the time it didn't, I knew it wasn't right in terms of like people are you know, would flip out if they knew, Mm -hmm. but also in a really twisted way, I felt like I was doing my job as a wife to keep my husband happy, right? Like if I couldn't do it, someone else could. And by allowing him, I was in a weird twisted way, fulfilling my wife, my role as a wife. And that really reflects the wrong view of authority and submission right. that is perpetrated because I'm not a replacement for God in my wife's life. Mm-mm. She's accountable for her decisions. Mm-hmm. And the Bible talks about submission from a wife, but it also talks about love from a husband and mutual submission. And it's never right for a husband or for a wife to submit to sin. Mm-hmm. She, um, she's still accountable for herself. And there, there was such such a poor understanding of that, I think, too, that led to some of the confusion and, and other things that Jen will get to in a second. But I just, that comes to mind as we talk because, yeah, she, she felt like that was, in a twisted way, merited and even perhaps wholesome because mm-hmm. she's trying to love me well and that's her keeping me happy as part of that. Mm. We, we just came to this place where, I think, for nine months We were seeing other people. And during that time, I, I was being treated better by strangers than my own husband. And I was genuinely having a very good time. And I, I really believe that during this time, I, I came to an understanding that I was not saved because my conscience was not pricked. The only thing I could think of was I was afraid of other people finding out, but I didn't really care about God at this time. In fact, I was desiring that Brad would find a woman that he cared for more than me and that he would leave. Um, I was really hoping that that is what would happen, that this would kind of be my way out and it would look better than me just outright leaving if he found someone that made him happy because I felt like that wasn't me and then he would leave. And Mm -hmm. we got to a place where after nine months, apparently, and Brad can speak to this, his conscience was pricked. So while this was going on, I'm very, very influenced by pornography, selfishness, really just self-gratification and whatever makes me feel good. There's no understanding of selflessness and Christ-like love and self-sacrifice, self-control. <laughs> like that's not, that's just never entered into my mind. And I, so I'm with other people and I, unlike Jennifer, I felt guilty mm-hmm. and I kept push, pushing the guilt down like, I'm tired of feeling guilty. I'm tired of trying to, I'm tired of trying to tow this line of moralism that that's being fed to me every Sunday at church. I, I just, I'm listening to my flesh and living for the desires of the flesh, 
not for Christ, but knowing that that it's wrong and constantly feeling unfulfilled and unhappy. And this went, so this goes on for a while off and on. And I came to Jennifer just overwhelmed with guilt and darkness. Mm -hmm. And, and I said, this, this isn't right. It was wrong for us to do this. I want, I want my wife back. I want my, I want our life fixed. Like we have to do, we have to change something. And I think I knew spiritual things were at the heart of this, but I was in a church at the time that, that was very much like the church I grew up in, very legalist. And there was basically an understanding of the gospel is grace so far as God made this possible for you. Now you have to make a decision to what you're going to do for him. Right. And we heard that message every Sunday. And then beyond that was just a message of law. Like you do more, live better for God to make him happy, to be more pleasing and more righteous before God. And I, I struggled with that, knowing that there were flaws in it, but not knowing really what they were and where mm-hmm. to go from here. Right. And, and just giving into my frustration, sin of my heart and the struggles in our marriage, looking for satisfaction elsewhere then because mm-hmm. it's not here. And then quickly feeling the darkness of sin and the depths of the depravity of my heart, you know, and this isn't, this isn't right. This isn't the answer. And so I went, I went to Jen like, I'm, I'm done with this. I, I, can we stop? I like, we've done, we've agreed on everything up to this point. And I just had to, I had, it had to stop. And I felt that within her response was no, Hmm. I've, I'm, I'm being treated better by other people than you've ever treated me. Why would I want to stop? And it scared me. And I, it's like God just started humbling me. Mm-hmm. And feeling the responsibility of my poor decisions, I'll accept all of that. Of my sin, we're here because of me strongly. Right. Um, for the most part, I mean, it takes two to tangle, but I put us here. Right. And I said, "Well, so, you know, things have to change." And I started begging Jennifer to wait. Like she talked about leaving, she did not want resolution. We've tried this roller coaster of self-improvement and change. And it's always temporary. And every time it got worse after, and it was like, she's like, no, I I'm done. I'm done with all these chances. And I, at that point just begged her not to leave then and started giving her space. Mm-hmm. And I said, okay, selfishly, because I felt like, we've been here before we've done this. He's going to go backwards. And when he does, it will make me look better Mm -hmm. (laughs) because I gave him another chance. Right. And so I did, I stayed and it was really, really rough there for probably a couple of years where I was incredibly distant. I just really didn't want anything to do with him. And I thought again, that permanence view of like, I think at this time I was probably 26 turning Mm -hmm. 27. And I thought if I left, um, I will never be allowed to remarry. And I would rather, you know, have this comfort of being provided for and not being alone rather than being on my own with a small child and having to figure all of that out. And so we ended up having during this time, having our second son. And after that time, I don't remember how old he was, but I remember kind of seeking because around that time I was also just ready to walk away from religion, to not go back to church, to not have anything to do with God because in my mind it was God that was keeping me in this state of despair. And I think too, meanwhile, I struggled with her withdrawing and yet just started to bear the responsibility of where we're at. And I began to see Christ Mm. and knowing like something's like there, there's things wrong with us. Yes. But that's not primarily the issue. Our our issues go deeper than this. And my first step was to go to our pastor then at that time. And I, and I opened up to him. He, he had no advice. He had no Mm. help. Uh, He didn't know what to say. He felt bad. And um, his response, literally at our kitchen table, 
we were considering leaving the church. I didn't tell him yet, but I wanted to give him a chance, like to open up and know the truth and what we're, where we were at, where we we're struggling with laid all the cards on the table. And he was quiet for a bit and then asked if we had ever thought about having more kids because he believed that, hmm. um, <laughs> any sort, any sort of contraception was wrong. And Jennifer and I looked at each other and jaws about hit the floor. Like, yeah, are you kidding me? That that's, that's what that's you have to answer. say after us doing this, have more kids. And, yeah. <laughs> uh, so we, at that point we started looking for a different church and I was like, there, there is no hope here. There is no hope and no help for us here. And it, it became more and more obvious. Now I didn't, I wasn't sure what, what that should look like, but I knew it wasn't here. Yeah. So that started, that started the next step of searching and looking outside the box. Cause I felt a, a lot of fear having a, a father who is a pastor and somewhat well known in the area or in our circle. Legacy is a huge thing. Oh, yeah. And, and there's Especially such an emphasis. Movement. Yeah, absolutely. There's such an emphasis on, on that. And I always feared letting him down or making him look bad. And I just reached this point where I thought if I went anywhere else, man, dad would, dad would hate it. Mm. <laughs> he would, and I feared how that would affect our relationship. And, and at this point I looked at the walls crumbling around me and, and thought it doesn't matter. Yeah. None, of, it, none of that matters. We have to do something different yeah. and we're at it. We're at it on a dead end road. So, okay. Well, I want to, I want to pause this right here and brothers yeah. and sisters in Christ. I want you to think about this. You see how detrimentally bad theology and really coming from a bad theological construct, a bad understanding of the gospel, all of these things. This is a real world example of two people who really ultimately, I think, wanted to know and love the Lord, but just didn't know how to do it because they didn't have the right information. They didn't have, for, for whatever reason, God and his grace and, and his sovereignty brought them along at the time that he did. He brought them through what they've been through into this hot mess of not only their younger lives, but coming together, having a, what could be called a very volatile relationship and all kinds of misunderstanding of who God is all over the place. If we want to talk about broken vessels, brothers and sisters in Christ, Brad and Jen were broken vessels. They had come to the point of experiencing true brokenness as a result of not only their own sin, but the sin of others and the sin of this world. That's what we talk about on this podcast. Brokenness comes more than from just our own sin. And that is definitely a part of it. Brad's been completely open and honest about that. Jen has been completely open and honest about that. But it's also the sin of others. It's the things that we're brought up in. That has an effect. There's a context to why we think the way that we think. There's a context to why we come into life and into our adult lives and interact with other people. There's a context there. And to write that off and to pretend like that's not there is just not being honest. And living in the reality that we live in a broken, fallen world. But the good news is this. <laughs> And we're getting ready to get to that. Jesus Christ heals it all. The gospel heals it all. So Brad and Jen, you've shared with us kind of what you came from, how you all came together, kind of the mess that came together as a result of your marriage and just the bad way of thinking. But Brad, you've already alluded to it. Something changed. Something started changing. You, You had that conviction of sin and you're like, something ain't right here. I need to figure this out. And God came in and he did something in your all's lives. That's the good stuff. That's what we want people to see is the hope and encouragement that they can find in Christ through the gospel. How did that change from what you were way back then to where you're at now? Jen, you go ahead and start and then we'll let Brad go into that after that. Sure. 
I began to see Brad changing. Um, it was little increments here and there, but just in how he would respond to me, he was giving me more space, you know, to to heal and he was actively trying to earn my trust back and I was seeing him seek God. Um, And so, like I had said at that time, I was kind of just ready to walk away from it all, but seeing him really seeking God and then with that, seeing his changes in how he was treating me, I kind of began to search again. And again, I do not remember exactly when this was, but I do remember folding laundry and I had just read an article on the medical side of the crucifixion of Christ. This was nearing Easter and it was so horrible and gruesome. (laughs) The, like the physical things that our Lord went through in his crucifixion. And then I was listening to a song by Flame featuring NF called Start Over. And in it, a few of the words, he says, so whatever it is that you've done, he put that punishment on his son. You'll never come under his condemnation, conquer sin and Satan and his accusations. So dry your eyes, lift up your head. Hallelujah. God is not dead. Plus he gave us his peace and he took our guilt on the cross instead took our place and now we embrace a clean slate with the eyes of faith we know unfailing love unfailing love it's not too late to start over and at the time I had felt I mean if my having sex with my husband before we were married made me a you know crushed rose and a piece of chewed up piece of bubble gum what now that I've slept with multiple men and I just I had felt like I am beyond the grace of God. I am beyond God wanting me. It, I'm, I'm too sinful now. And after hearing that, I, I knew I wasn't. And to believe I was, was to climb up on the cross and smack Jesus in the face and say, this is not enough. And it was then, I believe, that God opened my eyes and the Holy Spirit indwelled me. And it was from then on that I believe I I became a new creation. Mm -hmm. And um, we began seeking together the Lord. And not just in a, I want God to fix my life, but genuinely like seeking Him and wanting to know Him and not know about Him, but know Him. Mm Um, And it led us to a new church and just to really dive deep into theology. I am the type of person that, like, I thrive on information. It always drives Brad insane when we watch a movie because I'm the one that's going to IMDb, like, or, yeah, um, (laughs) and, like, researching all of the backstory and, you know, trivia of whatever we're watching. (laughs) So... I I love to learn and to read. And at the time, I was very alone, didn't really have friends. I didn't have, I mean, I tried to open up to people and say, you know, here's what's going on. And I ended up kind of on Facebook and in a lot of reformed groups, Mm -hmm. they would talk about abuse and they would talk about um, theology. And I kind of began reading all this information, articles, listening to podcasts, um, reading books that were recommended, just eating it all up and then sharing with Brad. And there was a time when Brad was working a job where he could listen to things throughout the day. And so, Mm -hmm. you know, podcasts and books and we would call and talk to each other and talk through what we were reading and, and listening to and, and learning. So, so Brad, go ahead and share like, yeah, your perspective from like what God started doing in you that brought you all to this point. Well, I think at the time I did, I, I didn't understand what all was happening. I just felt extremely humbled and like I was at a dead end all my life. I felt like I wanted to please God. I've been raised in this environment. I loved God in the way that I thought. I mean, I was raised in tried to pursue 
moral realities for myself to please him. And, and yet there was always the falling short and it never being enough and just empty an incredibly empty feeling. And throughout that pursuit, I'd get frustrated and pursue sin and get tired of, of trying. And then I, and then I would feel conviction from God and go back and, and seek Christ again. And, and there was the emphasis I talked about earlier of, of the legacy of my family, the church, this, the fear um, that is pushed from leadership and those environments to not associate with certain groups or certain theologies. It really was seated deeply in me. Even the idea of going to a different church, it wasn't until all of this happened and the heaviness of, of sin and my spiritual state that I was willing to even consider that. Like I just was afraid of pursuing anything differently and that had to change. You know, I, I felt like the fear that was, was controlling me wasn't right. And I needed to fear God more than I feared man. And at this point I feared man a lot. So I started seeking him and we started pursuing different things. And the, the church that we were in at, that we went to at that time was Calvinist and that was new to me. And I rejected it very strongly. And mm -hmm. I mean, that, that was so strongly rejected in my growing up. They preached messages against it and often misrepresented the theology entirely, but definitely with the intent to scare people away from it. Right. Um, and I, I argued a lot from my past, from my understanding, our pastor at the time, one time we sat down to talk about it. And he said, he took me to the book of Romans and he said, would you guys read the book of Romans together? Now, my dad has preached through the book of Romans many times, often taking a year plus to do it mm -hmm. all my life. And yet it always felt confusing and inconsistent and like his, his takeaways just inconsistent would be the best way that I could understand it. Right. And so I agreed he did. He wouldn't even talk about that doctrine at the time. He wanted us to, to read Romans together first. So we went home and, and I started listening to the book of Romans while I was driving for a living delivery and started listening to the Bible audi audibly. And Jennifer was at home and then we get home and we, did you hear, did you read this? Like what in the world? <laughs> yeah. How, how could we have ever read this before? And missed it. Awesome. And it was, <laughs> it was like the Bible just smacked us in the head. So, yeah. uh, so hard. We, I, we went through like once a separately and once together, I think. And then we went back to pastor and I said, I have a ton of questions, but they're all different now. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, that, that started something new. It started me to understand even our past, where we were, who we are, who God is, the depravity of our hearts, why we, why we choose to believe what we do apart from Christ, why why our fl our flesh is dictating decisions and our understanding of God is is so flawed and it, it just shone so much light on a lot of things and we began to pursue that and that was just the beginning you know but to understand the righteousness of Christ to understand sanctification that when when Christ said that he who began a good work in you will complete it to see that not only did he die for our justification, but he died for our sanctification and for our glorification. And that in the imputed righteousness of Christ through the grace of God, we are clean and every sin that we've ever committed and will commit yet. He's already bore the penalty of that. It re evaluates that moralistic lifestyle. And it, it brings the law so much higher. I think the moral law, the, the demands that God puts on us are unattainable yeah. to our sinful flesh. They, they aren't something we will ever be able to pursue and complete. And then we realize, the we yep. realize that Christ is the fulfillment of that. Right. Yep. yep. Yeah. And, and I've heard that. I've always heard that phrase and, and thought that, but only in, in so much as he's justified me, mm -hmm. like that God started it, but now it's up to you to keep going and, and complete it. Right. And if you don't, if you don't do your part, then you're going to thwart God's sanctification on you. I think that 
much like salvation initially, you know, often people pray a prayer or experience a change like Jennifer talked about. And all of those things can be an experience of salvation. But too often we take our experience back into scripture and then use it to define what scripture is saying. Like, well, because this is how I experienced it, then this is what is happening. Right. And, and to realize that, you know, we, we do experience it in different ways. But we do what we do in terms of repentance, of right living, and even obedience to the law after regeneration. We do it because of the grace of God changing mm-hmm. us. We don't do it in any way to produce anything or to make us better Christians. Christ has already made us perfect because he, when he looks at us, he sees himself. Yeah. So yeah. Now, now sanctification is more or less a lifetime of gratitude well realizing who you are and more and more living into that yeah. you know what i mean it, it, yep. forgetting forgetting who you were and realizing who christ has made you and then just being that yeah being who he's made you union but, um, union in christ uh, i've i've heard this over and over from brothers and sisters that we know and love that teach the truth Sanctification is a matter of acting like who we are. It's Amen. realizing who we are in Christ and saying, hey, that's what I want to be. I, I want to reflect that. But it, it's not this like requirement. It's there's, right. there's not this fear that, well, if you're not acting like who you are, then somehow you're, you've lost your salvation or you're not saved or you're not this. That desire is there in our hearts. And we don't do it perfectly. And we just have to look to Christ. And uh, as they say on uh, Theocast, a podcast that we all know and love, trust Christ, calm down, look to him, (laughs) rest in him, uh, trust in him. And uh, again, act like who you are. That's really what it comes down to in sanctification, understanding our union in Christ um, not that that sanctification somehow has some kind of a uh, uh, an effect on our acceptance before God, and so or, it, that's or, or future acceptance, it, as some would say <laughs> exactly, and, and it's life changing. It truly is life changing. Yep. It really helps I, you to be able to live in in the gospel and. Uh, not live the gospel, but live in the gospel, and what it does is it allows us to be able to grow truthfully, organically, from the power of the Holy Spirit working through our lives. I would just tie it all back together as we're we're discussing the gospel now. Looking back, we see all sorts of reasons that could have and do affect choices we make and so forth. But a a large part of change that I see for myself anyways is that we all, by nature, I think we look to things for fulfillment and purpose and satisfaction that God never intended us to look to, whether that be a marriage relationship or sex or kids or just so many aspects of life mm-hmm. that Christ was meant for. He was meant to satisfy our deepest longings. And often when we don't understand that, we look to something else for that. Yeah, it's it, it's a matter of, in a sense, like what the children of Israel did, right? They would look to idols. Famous quote, John Calvin, the human heart is an idol factory. And that's just the reality of the broken world we live in. And because of our, our bent, we look to other things to fulfill ourselves. But when we really, truly look to Christ and who he is for us, he is the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. He's our God, and he's the only one that can fulfill those longings. Well, brothers and sisters, I, I want to thank you for joining us for this episode today. This couple, I'm sure this has not been an easy thing for them to do, to just put it all out there and share the experience that they've had. But I hope, by God's grace, hearing a real life real world experience of coming out of a certain ideology 
and the detrimental effects that that had on them individually and as a couple. But then the great and good news, what God did through the gospel in healing their relationship. And you may be thinking to yourself, well, that's good for them, but that didn't happen with me. Well, you know what? Y'all know that didn't happen with me either. But again, understanding the sovereignty of God. God takes us through what he takes us through for a purpose and for a reason. And we just have to trust him. We have to believe in what he's brought us through in our lives is for our good and for his glory. And we live, again, as Brad talked about in our sanctification, acting like who we are once we understand that, and just resting in him, knowing that he is our hope, he is our purpose, he is our our righteousness, he is he is our all in all. And, you know, praise God for a couple like this that have been through the ringer, but the gospel came in and healed them, and we should all be rejoicing in that. And I, 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 I can almost guarantee you, Brad and Jen would tell you, we're not perfect, man. <laughs> we still struggle. I'm, I'm sure yeah. they would be very honest about that. But praise God that God did this a miraculous work in their hearts, in their lives, and in their marriage, even in spite of the abuse, the mm-hmm. uh, the effect of the the bad theology, all of that. Even though all of that happened, God came in and He rescued these two people, and He rescued their relationship together, and that's something to rejoice in. It's something to be thankful for. And brothers and sisters in Christ, another thing you got to remember too is that this is a perfect example of what it means to be a broken vessel. Broken vessels. God comes in. He breaks us. He breaks down our pride. He takes away, as Brad was just saying, the idols that we look to. He draws us to himself and he says, look to me, I'm it. And once we grasp that by his grace, amazing things happen in our lives. And God can do that in your life as well. But you got to look to him. Look to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Brad and Jennifer, I I, I just want to thank you guys so much for just coming on my podcast, sharing your story, being open, being vulnerable, and telling the world, we're broken vessels, but you know what, Jesus came in and he he's healing us thank you so much for coming in and sharing today amen thank you yes thank you for Glory to god us. yeah praise god well brothers and sisters in christ i want to thank you again for joining us for the broken vessels podcast and we'll see you next week mm-hmm.